One more coming in. Welcome, welcome. Okay, they're coming in. Okay, great. See, they're coming. Here we go. You know, we, okay. We, we, <laughs> play, we play it off like, listen, we wanted everyone to come to the nightclub, but you got to know the right guy to get in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jason's got joke. <laughs> hey, Ruth. Hey, Jason. We're overdue for coffee. I we absolutely are, I'm, and I'm done. Tra well, after this weekend, I'm done traveling. So let's I'm go. going away this weekend too, and I'm so excited. It's going to be an epic road trip. Nice, 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 nice. nice. Hey, Ruthie. Hey, girl, how are you, Kathy? Good. Life is good. I like to say that I'm stable, but good sounds better. <laughs> oh, I just got back from a um, family vacation, so. Midwest? Yeah, went to Iowa. I haven't gone back to Indiana yet. I want to, but my mom is like super, like, yeah. My mom was too, but um, she kind of settled down after a while. My a couple of my nieces and nephews got sick, and they were like, "Man, eh, it's not too bad." And so my mom was like, "Okay." <laughs> so, but, uh, but I think some people are, you know, it just depends on their immune system and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, my my mom's like a. Anyway, yeah, good to see you. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I feel it. <laughs> All right, well, we're just waiting uh, for a few more minutes. Um, apparently, you guys did not get the link until the last minute. We apologize on that. That's an internal mistake, but. We're, we just sent it out real quick, so we just want to give everyone a minute to at least click it and get in here, because we know we had a bunch of you guys RSVP. So thank you for your patience. I'm going to just wait like two more minutes. Yeah, uh, we're up to 16 now. How many did we have? 30 something? It was 30. just about 30, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we doing a board meeting like every other month? We're going to have one um, next week. Um, we're going to try and get back to having them the week after the luncheon. Okay. Because I, I need to, I need to, I need to check in with you guys <laughs> more for me. <laughs> it's me. It's yes, I'm Madam like, President. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like, it's not that like I'm trying to control it, but I'm like, I don't even know what's going on. I know that I know we're all doing it, but I just I just need updates for peace of mind, I feel like. Um, I just got the email, so Yep. Oh, okay, so, hopefully we're gonna get a few more coming in here in a minute or so then. Yeah, it was slow for me for some reason. Don't know why. Have anyone else yet? So. I just want to make sure that as many people that wanted to hear this get to hear this. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to waste your time, but I don't. I also am like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I don't want them to miss it. <laughs> no worries, it's all okay. If they have to leave, they have to leave, right? <laughs> It did black out until 1.30. I always do just in case, so. Are you guys, Bridget and Vishal, you guys are okay time-wise? We're fine, yes. Okay. Oh, I'm fine. Okay, I just wanna make sure. Thank you. Uh, 
Hello, hello, guys. One more. Oh, yeah. Kathy, I wonder if I can make you. Well, no, I don't want to mess it up because I don't know if it'll ruin like my screen sharing and stuff. So never mind. I was going to say I should just let you have let everyone in. We'll have to do like a test run on our our board meeting next week and see if we can just like swap some of the roles. Um, I think. Well, down at the bottom, you used to do a screen share, but that doesn't. Yeah. So now yeah, I just don't know if I were to make you the host, if it just like totally ruins what I've got going here. Yeah. <laughs> I think you should have multiple hosts. I mean, you should be able to have multiple hosts, I believe. Yeah, you can have an alternate host. You can have an alternate host in case. Oh, co-host. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, Kathy, I'm going to make you my co-host so that you can just admit. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so. then you clicked on security and gave the speakers uh, screen share rights. I didn't, but um, I have their their slides. Oh. We I just put everything all in one so that we're it's easier. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so what do I, I don't, do I see something change? Do you, at the bottom, where it says participants, does it allow you, I mean, nothing, there's no one there waiting to come in yet, but you can see the participants, and then usually right above that, it has uh, the waiting room list, and then mm -hmm. it'll have a button that says admit. Yeah, it'll, it'll pop up on your screen, Kathy. Okay, well, there's nothing there. So if someone comes in, then I'll... Then you'll be able to see. So if, once they come in, I'll, I'll, I mean, hopefully we can at least get one more in the next couple minutes. Um, if we're asking if anything changed. I have to say, you look great as a co-host. I mean, wow, the new look. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, honey. <laughs> yeah, you'll see. It'll pop up on your screen, Kathy. No worries. Okay. All right, well, we're going to get started. <laughs> um, let me see here. Let me just a little bit. All right. So, welcome, everyone. I'm so excited for you all that could join us. I do apologize for the technical difficulties with the link, but I'm glad that you're here and we understand if you have to jump off, we get it. Um, so today our webinar is about the future of academics and effective parent communication tactics. Just for a quick little background, I do want to show some love to our annual, annual sponsors as of course we appreciate them always. We miss Flemings. We cannot wait to get back. Um, we do have some fun ideas in the mix that we've figured out amongst our board for you guys because we don't want to put anyone's health at risk, but we do miss going to Fleming's. So we've got some fun stuff coming up. And we also always love to highlight our annual sponsor, UNLV Lee Business School. And if you're new to AMA or never been to a uh, luncheon with us, we do normally do raffles um, and those go toward the money from that goes toward our AMA scholarship fund. But of course we are not able to do this right now. We're going to try and figure out maybe if we can do something where we mail it to you guys because that would, I mean, that's fun. <laughs> and then I just want to see, is anyone hiring? If you are hiring, please take yourself off mute and just quickly give us like 30 seconds of what's going on. Nope. Okay. Upcoming events. Um, the only thing scheduled right now, uh, we have our next luncheon. Nothing is confirmed, um, but we, our goal for the October luncheon is casino marketing, how and why they play our games, the, really just the psychology of gaming. And always, always follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. We love to hear from you, hear ideas. If you guys have someone in mind who you think would be a great speaker and maybe a topic. Oh no, sorry. And maybe a topic. Um, but 
of course, yes, please share that. Sorry, I got distracted with that one. And now our feature presentation. The, again, the future of academics and effective parent communication tactics. We do have two guest speakers today. I am going to introduce them one at a time. So first I will introduce Bridget Phillips. She is, oops, let me get to her, sorry. She, Bridget Phillips. She's the Chief Academic and Operations Officer at Durrell Academy of Nevada. And I would like to, her to introduce herself a little bit. So go ahead, Bridget. Oh, okay. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, you, you brought me a note, sorry. Well, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I, I wanted to start by sharing just a little bit of background information um, about myself. Um, I actually was in the school district for 27 years as a teacher and assistant principal and principal, but I concluded my last six years in the school district um, as the director of the school community partnership program. And so I was um, in that role, um, very blessed um, to serve in some very unique roles. And I was the liaison to the Kennedy Center. And in that, in that time, um, I would spend time in DC with Candy Schneider from the Smith Center and just seeing the great work um, that they were doing with arts integration. And I was approached by um, Academica Management Company and they asked if I wanted to open a charter school, um, what type of a charter school would I open? And I talked about an arts integration charter school. And that's how I landed here. So it was very exciting um, to kind of go into a, another phase of, of, a, of education um, by opening the first Doral, Doral Saddle eight years ago. Um, I'm going to share with you a little bit today. I'm kind of broke my presentation into three parts so that we can have some question and in answer time. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between um, charters and traditional public schools and private schools. I'm also going to talk a little bit about Durrell in particular, um, and then get into, I know, the meat of what was marketing like prior to closure in March, and then what was different after um, our closure. So first, I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, like I mentioned, um, some similarities and differences um, about charters. Um, first, um, I'd like to, to say that we are public schools. Sometimes people feel that we're private schools, and I think we have a little bit of that feel. I know Mr. Soto is on the, on the, on the line. We do have a little bit of a kind of a hybrid feel. Um, know that we do receive the same amount of pure pupil funding, but we don't get the funding for the bricks and mortar. So that's where you hear sometimes where charters don't get the same level of funding because we don't get the funding for the bricks and mortar. Um, we're governed by a board of directors. And so we get that very um, kind of that personal um, uh, kind of a feel because our boards are often, members are often parents. So they're in our schools and they're very involved and engaged. Um, we um, also um, are, we do have a management company, like I mentioned, and some management companies are for profit and some are not for profit, but all of the schools are nonprofit. So I did want to share that. Um, we, we do, our employees do receive PERS, so they do have a retirement system, which is nice. Um, also, charters are often known for more flexible leave. Um, our teachers receive 11 days of PTO time, which is kind of nice. When I was a young teacher, you know, you do receive sick days, but you might have that special wedding that you have to fly somewhere for, and, and typically I couldn't go. So our teachers know that, you know, they could take a couple days for that wonderful life experience that they would like to be a part of, and I think that's often very um, inviting to our teachers. Our teachers do have a year-to-year -year contract, um, which I, I have to say, in my 27 years in the school district, and I also had some experience in the private sector, 95% of teachers are passionate and, and just really um, enthusiastic about their job. But there's that 5% that unfortunately sometimes can take the profession. So just knowing that um, we can um, not renew those teachers' contracts for the benefit of our children, I think is a plus for, for charters. Next slide. So some things that are really appealing to me about charters and some things that are, that are a little bit different that are maybe even advantageous to school districts are, are listed on that slide. First, um, 
I think the exciting part about charters is they encourage innovation. And so that was really appealing to me um, when I had the opportunity to open Doral Academy, is to, to be an arts integration charter school and to be very innovative in, in our approach to instruction. Um, we do have more autonomy. And I think part of that is the size. And I think it really um, fared well for us with our closure. We were able to close and within a week able to offer distance education. Um, and I know that some of those constraints in, in, um, you know, are seen in bigger districts. So I think the autonomy is something that fares as well. High, high accountability, but having that autonomy to do what needs to be done for students. Um, in charters, you typically have high parent involvement, um, and I think that's exciting as well. We have children that come from everywhere, but the parents want them to be there. Compensation, um, we do do in uh, charter, in our charter, we do have a pay for performance model um, for raises. And I think that's very exciting as well. I know when I go out and I talk to our new teachers, I, I talk to some of them because some of them have had experiences um, in other districts. And I said, how many times have, have you had a teacher maybe next to you, you know, in the classroom next to you, and that teacher, you know, maybe, you know, skedaddled out the door right when the bell rang and you worked hard at night and on the weekends and you gave, you know, 200% for your students. Do you really think it's fair that they get the same raises you the following year because they've lived another year and all of the teachers are like yes I think that should be differentiated so we do have a pay for performance structure that rewards high performance and achievement and so I think it's exciting and I think it's exciting that our teachers embrace that um, sometimes school districts like Clark County School District um, do receive better pricing um, because they're they're paying for items in bulk. And so that's something as we get bigger and we work and to maximize with other academic management um, schools, some of the things that we, we can kind of have a little more buying power, but that is a positive in, in, with larger districts. And sometimes you do hear that when people talk about breaking up Clark County School District. Um, and then the last piece I wanted to mention was integration. I know that we were a little late in Nevada um, coming to the table with charters, but, but typically over time, charters became, become naturally integrated. And we've seen that over time. We have a lottery. Um, we've taken a lot of steps um, to increase um, our demographics and, and to um, expand our reach. Um, we run our own free and reduced cost lunch program because one, it's the right thing to do, but it takes an enormous amount of time. But just by providing those type of services, we're able to make sure that everyone has access to our academy. So I know, Marissa, we were going to kind of break. We thought this might be a good place for any questions, and then we could go on to the other two pieces. Are there any questions at this time? I'm not seeing any in the chat box, but if, yeah, if you guys, this is open conversation. If you have any you'd like to ask, go ahead. Okay, none yet. Okay. <laughs> next so, slide. next slide. <laughs> So I wanted to talk just a little bit about Doral Academy. And um, Mr. Soto, feel free to chime in. But, um, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, just the opportunity to open an arts integration charter was just so exciting for me personally. That something that I think is really unique is that um, up until last year, we were the first K through 12 arts integration school in the country. Now we have, um, there's another school on the East Coast, but we are, and people don't always know this, we are the only arts integration K through 12 system in the country, which is truly amazing and exciting. And that uh, opens up some just some wonderful opportunities for us to share at a national level and for, for people to come and spend time in our school. Um, we did open our school eight years ago with one um, Durrell campus, which was our Durrell Saddle campus, and we opened um, at, actually as a K-7 and then the following year a K-8, and we now have 
four K-8 campuses and one K-12, and we have a little over 6,000 students with a very, very extensive waiting list. Um, we have, even since our inception, um, been involved in partnerships and collaboration. When we first opened, we worked in collaboration with the Kennedy Center, the Smith Center, Nevada Ballet Theater. We've expanded over time with um, collaboration with Nevada School of the Arts and just wonderful local arts organizations. Are there any questions about Doral Academy? Or Mr. Soda, you want to add anything? I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> Bridget, what was that number that you said? How many people are on the waiting list? Um, there actually are thousands on the waiting list, but I will say that some parents, um, you know, they just, and this is what I love about our parents, is sometimes they'll put themselves on multiple schools and they just go into whatever school they can get in because they know after the first year they will get some preferences with transfer. So even though we have about a thousand on each school so you're looking at 6,000 plus it's not always completely accurate because some of those parents are on more than one school site sure and I and I bring that up for everyone on the call because it took me personally two years to get my daughter into Doral Academy and it was worth the wait uh -oh. arts integration I think is something maybe you should expand on a little bit more so they understand the value of that but when you have the opportunity to have your child in a charter school, especially the Doral program, there's just a lot more attention to not only their level of education and involvement at the teacher level, teachers are really engaged and that makes a big difference. And then that translates over into the child really wanting to strive for whatever personal art uh, they wanna do, whether it's dance or, or music or any of those things. And, I think if anything, the team or the group here should probably wants to know a little bit more about arts integration. They do. They're asking that. Okay. <laughs> so go ahead, Bridget. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and you brought up some, some good points. Well, first of all, arts integration is teaching through and with the arts. And so I'll give you my elevator speech. Um, first, we talk about exposure. So, um, I, and I, the fact that you're in the marketing, I think this would be very, um, in PR, very interesting to you. So starting in first kindergarten, first grade, our students get exposed to media arts, violin, dance, um, music. Um, uh, they, they get exposure to visual arts. Um, we also do push in Spanish. So they're exposed to all of the different art medium. And so that happens. So we talk about exposure. We also work in collaboration, like I said, with, with local artists. So we have artists coming in, sharing their experiences, their backgrounds. Um, we, we also spend time making sure that our students are seeing live performances out in the community. Then we work, like I said, with the Kennedy Center artist. So for instance, um, our students are exposed to different arts integration strategies. So we think of uh, one great strategy is called um, VTS. And some of you, if you have visual arts background, um, know that it's a, it's a strategy um, that um, can be used to help with instruction. So what an example was portrait work. So one of the um, things that you could see in our schools where our students might be learning um, about something in American history, well, before the students begin to read about um, those experiences in American history, they would actually go through and study portraits. And so they would look deeply at those portraits. And we know that society often tells many stories through their arts. So then they would um, look at those portraits and then they would begin to read about those historic periods in time. So it gives those children a lot of prior background. One other example I'll share is we use a lot of what's called tableau. So like in a fifth grade classroom, um, they were learning about um, historical leaders over time. So the students worked in groups to research and to learn about those historical figures. And then they did tableaus where they created the backdrops um, with PVC pipes and then they did um, tableaus it kind of reminds me of masters of the arts you know in Laguna where they do frozen pictures of time and they do reenactment um, about their historical figure so it's highly engaging and you can see how children learn no matter what their background is they're going to learn from that be it they're highly gifted or if they're a child that maybe um, has limited English 
English background, they're going to learn and benefit. And that's what a lot of the research with arts integration shows. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Bridget. We do Great. have another question, but I'm yeah. going to wait because you're going to get to those slides. It's from Ruth. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, then we will jump, jump into the marketing piece. Here we go. So prior to COVID, um, I, I mentioned in Nevada, charters were a little late coming to the party. So I think with that, there's not always or wasn't always an awareness. And, and sometimes there was mixed messaging. And we'd often say, if we don't tell our story, somebody else is going to tell our story for us. And so we need to be careful that we're telling that our stories correctly. So before closure, we did a lot of the traditional methods, you know, literature, materials. But we also were learning through our journey, through many, many um, folks that have helped us along the way. So some of the things um, that we were working on was updating our Facebook page because we have some parents. Um, we have one parent that actually has designed a lot of the, the websites on the strip. And he said, you know, this is a little hard to navigate. And so we had parents working with us to help us to make sure that our social media was really where it needed to be and was easy to navigate. We also um, uh, worked with our on our Facebook page. We did our first Giving Tuesday. A lot of our focus before closure was um, on, on raising funds um, to create a performing arts venue um, where our students at all of our campuses could perform and also they, they could work with local artists. We had um, people like um, from Cirque du Soleil that were on our committee because we wanted to do shared work. And so that was a lot of our focus before closure. We did have and create a foundation where we had representatives from each of our schools on the foundation so we could give communication in and communication out. We did a gala to um, also be able to thank donors in our community um, and to also make an uh, allow for more awareness. We did start working, and I know you work with Three Square. We started working with Julie Murray. Um, for the first time ever, we used a little bit of funds and she didn't charge us hardly anything because she's wonderful. And I said, our foundation didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> and so she worked with us um, uh, from Moonbridge Group on how to create a plan, a funding plan um, uh, and a marketing plan to build our theater. And then she actually introduced us um, to John Wagner from UNLV, from Next Level Nonprofit, to also look at other mechanisms to tell our story and to be able to raise funds for our performing arts venue. Um, and uh, we also worked with, with all of you, and, and I, I think in many capacities. I know we have um, folks on this call that work in the media stations. I know we, we really um, focus on the best of Las Vegas and the Review Journal, and we've been a gold medal winner for the last couple years. I, I served on the Channel 13, Raising the Bar, um, uh, so that we could kind of share our story and get the good word out. And so, so we really did really try to reach out also um, out to our community. And there was another piece that we did is, and it, through that work with Julie, um, we started getting funding from wonderful donors like Winsong Trust because we were telling our story and showing that over the years we were making great academic and achievement gains through arts integration. I'm just thrilled to announce that last year um, eight out of our 10 schools were five stars and two were four. And we attribute a lot of that to the arts integration approach. And this year we got our mid-year data. We were on track to all five stars. So being able to show that data to, to um, donors and to say invest, yes, invest in us and you are gonna see results. Um, actually, I think went a very, very long way. So that was before, <laughs> do we have any questions about that? And then we'll talk about after. Congrats, congrats on that. Um, so I'm gonna tell you, because I feel like you might, you may cover this, I'm gonna tell you the question for the next slide. Okay. What are your staff and also your kids struggling with now and how are you showing value to slash involving the families with the current limitations due to COVID? So I'm, I feel like you'll touch on this. But that I, is the question. I will, I will, <laughs> and, and, and absolutely. And it, it really will show how we changed gears. Thank you, Marissa. Of course. So after closure, it really, especially when you're dealing with COVID-19, 
the priority of a performing arts venue kind of had to go to the back. I, it really did because um, we had other priorities that were very evident. And so um, I mentioned that within one week we went to distance learning, but one of the things that we found very quickly, because we are an arts integration based school, we had parents that work for CERC, we had gig workers, we were starting to see that the priority really had to focus on our parents in need. So we started a very, um, uh, very quickly, a parent in need kind of a movement and parents were wonderful. They, they were donating. Um, we actually did a virtual um, fundraising event, which was, which was very exciting. And we had 13 and three cover that event to raise funding for our families. And these were families that we, you typically would not have been in this situation. We also really ramped up um, our social emotional support. We have counselors and a few years ago, the state started allocating funding for um, so the social worker and school program. And so each of our sites have a marriage and family therapist and they were a godsend um, to be able to work with our families um, and to provide them the support. We were literally, um, originally when we first started, we were bringing groceries. Then we started doing gift cards for food for our families just because of the nature of what was happening. So it really had to, to look differently. Um, one of our schools, um, each of our schools were doing surveys just to gauge with our parents how the distance instruction was going. Did they need access to social emotional support? And one, um, one school in particular, um, the way that their survey was crafty, crafted, in a April had 40% of their families that some way had been financially impacted by COVID. So we realized we really had to change what we were doing and continue to provide that support with our families. In May, we completely changed our teacher surveys and our parent surveys. And our surveys actually were broken in parts and it talked about before closure and after closure because we wanted to be prepared for, for the opening reopening of school. And we wanted to also provide support over the summer. Um, we actually implemented Hazel Health at two of our schools. We'll be implementing those in all of our schools in the fall to provide medical services for families because some families were getting some of that support in the school setting and some families had lost insurance. Um, so we wanted to provide those services to our families. Um, and also, um, we throughout this process before, um, we um, actually had uh, had started distance learning. We had done major distributions with computers and just materials for our students so they could be successful. In the summer, we worked with a hundred plus stakeholders from all of our schools to start to craft our reopening plan. And we have some parents with wonderful expertise. Um, we worked with Veronica Meter, who who has her own PR firm. We worked with medical experts. We are just so blessed to have such parents with such talent. And so we worked throughout the summer to create a comprehensive reopening plan that could be adjusted based on data. And so we originally were going to be started in a hybrid, but because of data, we had to make a quick change and then open our school year in a distance format. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to do it better. So some of the things that we prepared for is one, we were getting a lot of training in the summer. Um, in the spring, they talk about distance learning in crisis mode. And so a lot of our work was um, asynchronous or recorded videos. Um, and we saw the research that it said you needed to have some of everything. You need more synchronous to provide students with immediate feedback. But it also the research talked about that students shouldn't be sitting under a, on a computer all day. So we talked about what would we need to do as far as materials to give students in their home um, materials that would allow them to be off of a screen. So for an example, um, in a lot of our research, it said that um, uh, that it, you it's fine to be reading um, ebooks for pleasure. But if you have text that's very complicated, a student should actually have a book in their hand. So this year, 
not only did we give out computers, we also gave out hotspots. We also gave out materials. So we did a huge distribution to really ramp up and bring um, our instruction to the next level. We also um, have social emotional supports uh, materials to help our children because we know nobody is untouched in this. Um, everybody's experiencing it in some way. And so we just wanna make sure that we provide you know, all, um, all um, access and all materials for every child in Doral. And so um, we have a short little video that Marissa's gonna share, and then we could open up to, for some more questions that was recently on channel three that I know, um, and I thank so much um, uh, for um, her and her team to um, Shah Shahab uh, crop this and just did um, made this a much, a much shorter video. <laughs> all right, um, let me make sure that you guys here, I want to make sure you'll be able to hear it. Just a sound of speaker. All right, I'm going to play it. Can uh, someone just in the chat just let me know if you can hear it? Yes? No? Okay, let me see. I think I gotta change this to. I know it's like share computer audio. Okay, here. Okay. All right, there we go. Charter schools are funded by you, but they follow a different set of rules, and that includes an earlier start to the school year. In tonight's special report, News 3's Alexis Gorey with how Las Vegas charter schools are accommodating thousands of students during this pandemic. Student safety precautions are installed. Next. Temperature checks at the door. Sanitation stations dispersed throughout campus, but the halls sit empty here at Doral Academy. Just up until um, recently, we were going to start in a hybrid mono, but because of the uptick, we are going to be starting in distance, um, a distance fashion starting on the 24th. Bridget Phillips is the Chief Academic and Operations Officer with Doral Academy of Nevada, an arts integrated charter school. With five locations across the valley, Phillips says more than 6,000 students will return for distance learning this fall. And some lessons that we learned from the spring. We are looking at more time where a student would be with their teacher on a live type of a format so that they can get immediate feedback. Students will receive computers for live Zoom instruction. They're also putting together curriculum bags and books, social emotional supports, so that when you are we're teaching our children, they may have some time, they'll have some time in live instruction, but they'll also have time where they get to go work with a real book. But this reopening plan changed on the fly following the announcement of Governor Steve Sisolak's new county level approach to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. I did make a re recommendation last week uh, that our schools that are opening prior to Monday, August 24th, open up in a virtual environment um, or a distance education environment with a limited uh, exception if they want to bring in some of their highest need students for additional supports. Rebecca Fiden is the executive director of the State Public Charter School Authority. It oversees 67 charter campuses across the Silver State, most of them in Clark County. And ensuring that they are doing the very best they can by taxpayer dollars and for our children. Each public charter school has its own governing board in charge of creating a reopening plan specific for the needs of their school. The board submits its plan to the charter school authority for approval. They must be in compliance with the governor's directives and prepared to transition to hybrid or distance learning. Their team of stakeholders, who are also Doral Academy parents, started drafting a reopening plan back in May. Phillips says it is designed to be easily adapted to evolving situations with COVID-19, which is what she says makes charter schools unique. Well, we're very hopeful um, that we will be able to open in a hybrid model after nine weeks. But we also care deeply about the safety of our students, our staff, and the entire Doral community. So we will be looking at data. We will be making informed decisions. In Las Vegas, I'm Alexis Gorey reporting for News 3. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Bridget. Thank you. And Marissa, I did want to just share that um, that 
those of you that are in broadcasting and other areas, you helped us tell our story. I know we also, we had our first graduating class and we had, I know Channel 8 helped us share that story. So you helped us in these very difficult times. And I can't say enough, um, you know, enough thank you to all of you that have helped us in these difficult times um, tell our parents and tell our community what we're doing. So thank you. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce you guys to Vishal Chamaria, the founder of Sapiens Learning Center. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. So, uh, yes, so I'm Vishal. I'm like, I founded this company, Sapiens. And uh, I'll just share like what made me found this company. I mean, what was the idea behind this company? So, I mean, I moved here in America five years back and my daughter used to go in middle school at that time in sixth grade. Now she's in 11th grade, an amazing student. So I, I moved from Dubai and before that I moved from India. So the education quality of the education or the process of the education is quite different. And uh, I was struggling with my daughter to even keep up with that quality or keep up with that grade of education. So what I mean by the grade of education is that what I saw here is that the streamline, the structure and everything is so amazing, but uh, the process is lacking somehow. What we felt is that we focus on grades and the performance on a high level, but we don't go on the bottom to see why exactly if there's somebody is failing or somebody is not performing, what's the core reason? So I started sending my daughter to different tutoring companies. I mean, she went to Mathanasium, Command Tutoring Club and different companies. And uh, as a parent, I was struggling to understand what is exactly it is missing. In spite of spending money and in spite of putting all the efforts and time and energy and hope and dreams, nothing was working out the way, I mean, I was expecting it. So somehow we managed, okay, we saw, started going to the school, started meeting the teachers and all, and started understanding that how the public school system, I'm talking about the district, I mean, how this public school system is working, and again, I mean, I come back to Dodal, I mean, charter schools, it's when you think about charter school, you are like, oh my God, I have to wait for two, three, four years and I'm not sure whether I'll be able to get in or not. And you still have to continue with the district at that point of time. And uh, you don't want to lose that couple of years at, at the same time. So I was struggling and I came with an idea, I came with a reason, okay, fine, let's uh, do this because it's just not my problem. It's a problem of most of the parents, but... Uh, uh, we don't really focus. We don't really go to the bottom of it to see, okay, what we are missing. Oh, my great. I mean, what people see, what I have experienced here that, okay, my great, my, I mean, my child is getting A grade, B grade. I'm fine with it. I'm done. Okay, fine. But uh, I have seen kids like lots and lots of kids like going in six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10th grade. Their basic foundation is still missing. And I think uh, Bridget may agree with it or some of you may agree with it. That basic foundation is still lacking. And that's the reason. Overall in America, we have the percentages, it's the stats available that only 5% of high schoolers are considered to be fluent in mathematics. And that's extremely, extremely unfortunate in spite of spending so much of money and in spite of spending a big infrastructure around education. So that's really unfortunate. I mean, regarding, I'm just talking about mathematics. And when I started learning more about it, I got passionate and motivated and that's how we started this company here. We started operating this company last year in month of August. So it's technically just one year. And out of one year, we were closed for three months. So it was really a hard time, but uh, thank you. So that was the whole idea of the Sapiens. And the idea of the Sapiens is not just about education. We focus a lot about the brain development because only the education, only the books education or the academic education doesn't help your child or any child to become a successful person in terms of brain development in terms of knowledge you know because things are changing so fast whatever jobs we see today those jobs where most of the jobs will not exist in next 20 years for sure so we have to get prepared for the next thing and how you get prepared for the next thing it's by enhancing your brain capabilities that that's the only one solution so at our center we focus a lot about the brain development so yeah can we go to the next slide so <clears throat> And the reason, as I said, I mean, the why and how the tutoring centers will fill the educational gap because there's a huge gap. As I said, we are not focusing to see that, for example, a child knows what is two plus two. Everybody knows it's four, right? But there are different of 
ways to know four. Like somebody will know two plus two, four like that. And somebody will be like drawing four lines or counting two fingers like that, or counting two different objects, you know. So that's not the really important to just to know that, okay, I, do you know two plus two? That's not important. It's really, really very important to know how you know that. And in a school system, I mean, I don't blame schools. I mean, it's not their fault or something because at a school system, at, at the school system, it is really not that much possible to focus on each child individually to understand, okay, how they know it or what is the ways they know it. Are they fluent? Are they really strong on their foundation or not? So that's the reason that tutoring companies comes in place because we can really have individual attention to each and every child. I mean, that's an opportunity they have. And how this uh, educational gap can be filled, what I see, because as I said, I come from India and then I was in Dubai for five years before moving here. So my experience, me growing in India, what I've experienced that 80% of students in India, overall India, I'm talking about that big population, like 20% of the population of the world, which is there. 80% of the students at any point of their academic life, they go for additional education help because no matter what your uh, class size is, 20 kids or 50 kids, uh, one teacher will not be able to focus or understand or cannot go on a different individual pace of the class. And no matter how slow you go, no matter how fast you go, no matter what curriculum you built up, there will be for sure students always going really, really amazing faster and amazing slow as well, you know, extremely slow. So, and that's the reason in India, 80% of the students go to for that. And in America, what we saw, not even a quarter percent of the school going kids go for educational help, like additional educational help outside the school system, which is like barely, I mean, just a quarter percent. So, I mean, and I'm glad that in last five, seven years, what I have done, I mean, what I have seen that research and all, that in last five, seven years, people have started appreciating the additional educational help. They're not taking additional educational help anymore, like, uh, you know, like a thing, because the kids, what I have started seeing, that they're not taking it anymore, like, oh, why should I go for summer school? Why should I do this summer program? Because earlier it was that, it, the, I mean, the research shows that the kids were like, oh, summer program, I mean, I'm really behind or something like that, you know? But the, the thing is that everybody will be behind on something, but they have to really get on additional help in order to get there. And there's no other way other than the tutoring companies or charter schools like this can come up and really focus on individual kids. And yeah, so I just saw on a chat that, no, we are not just doing online. We started with a physical center and we are located right in Las Vegas. And uh, so the way we have made our tutoring place is also one of a unique idea that we made a lot of classrooms as well so that students, when they come here, it just not like feel like, okay, I'm just going to a tutor place or a tutoring company. They get very serious. They get into a discipline of learning because it's a classroom atmosphere. I mean, they have a proper classroom like they are going in the school. So we had built up a lot of classrooms and it was a, it was a tough idea for us to build it because when you start building something unique and new, you never know how people will react to it or what direction will it go to it. But that was the need that we found that it's needed to bring that thing. And again, the tutoring, again, I mean, I'll talk to you on the next slide about the discipline and the respect part. But over here, I will talk about the educational gap. Now about the consist, uh, one thing, I mean, uh, what I always feel, me personally, or as an institute, what we felt, that the consistent in the curriculum and the lesson plans is very much needed. Like in the charter schools, what I have seen, they have a particular they follow a particular uh, curriculum, right? I mean, Bridget may see that, that you guys picked up one particular curriculum and across the board, you are following that particular curriculum. So now teachers are not given a freedom to decide their own lesson plan or their own structure or their own pace of the class. It's being controlled by one governing board. Wherein in the district, where we have so many kids and teachers have, like every teacher has a freedom to decide their own lesson plan even though we have a, a, like a common core, you can say that, but it's not enforced in a way that every kid will be learning. If every second grader, for example, will not be learning at the same thing at the same pace, they will be all learning on different things. Somebody will be learning something and somebody will be learning something and even on a different methods. So, and that creates a lot of educational gap as well because me as a parent, and uh, if I want to help my child today at home, I am not able to help it, even though I know those concepts, 
because in a school they have been taught in a different method and if i'm going to teach her in a different method it confuses them so not being a consistent in a curriculum parents do not get opportunity to help them and they lose the interest they start getting disengagement and once you lose interest you stop motivating yourself to learn better and learning is very much related to the motivation because unless you are motivated you cannot learn something you you can do a task but doing a task and learning something from it it's a totally di like a different thing and oh. added to, yeah yeah we can go there the next one yeah okay so as i was talking about that what is the benefit it comes to the parents or to the students with the tutoring or tutoring companies like this that at sapiens what we had focused a lot on the discipline i mean the first thing i talked to parents and students here before you learn anything before you try to learn anything you should learn how to be disciplined because discipline is a thing that you cannot train yourself without being a discipline as i said at sapiens we are not focusing on just making kids learn but we are developing their brain and you cannot train your brain until you are disciplined enough because the discipline brings the consistency and and uh, like a, a, a respect because uh, i mean i don't know i mean uh, everybody has gone to the schools here have seen kids your kids are going to the school but the respect to the teachers what needed to be done that that is not available i mean that is not there now so if you go to the sports so say somebody's kids are training on a soccer or a tennis or something like that so they have been giving so much respect to their trainers because if they are asking them to do something they are doing it but regardless for the teachers that's not a, that's not there still so at sapiens we do focus a lot on the discipline part because discipline is much more needed then convenience for the parents so how we have done i mean uh, that's one big thing that convenience because again the tutoring why the why only one quarter of the people i mean uh, like quarter percent of the people get that kind of additional help because normally the tutoring when we talk about the additional educational help the first thing comes in general public mind oh my god it's going to be extremely expensive which i don't blame them which is it is because in the general market the threshold is about 30 35 dollars an hour where people in general make 10 12 13 14 dollars an hour so when people make that kind of a money it's not easy for them to spend that kind of money on a consistent basis because again education is all about keeping and consistent you cannot send your child for additional help for a couple of hours or a couple of days in a month and then you are done no you have to keep going with it so at sapiens what we try to do is that we try to bring that cost as low as possible so i mean we are trying to i mean right now we are uh, like we are doing this tutoring and all those things at a price range of 10 to 12 dollars an hour so because that gives them the opportunity to come and experience because until you experience you do not know what you are going to get from it and i have seen a lot of parents just in this few months that they have really appreciated and they have understood that that okay fine educational additional education help is needed no matter my kid is getting a grade but they are still lacking on the foundation they are still lacking on lot of concepts or they are still learning today this year something and next year they are not learning that because again mathematics is all about connecting the dots if you miss one dot your entire picture will go wrong like baking hmm? <laughs> like baking a cake <laughs> exactly anything any anything. construction is that any construction is that if you miss one part the entire construction will go wrong and mathematics is like that yeah. that if you are missing on say multiplication i mean you cannot do a bigger problems because you will always come back there and you will always use a scratch paper to do those but at sapiens we have really got some unique unique program which nobody in america teaches it and it's a mental math so we have seen kids i mean uh, at your 13 action also at fox a lot of kids have came there and like uh, demonstrated their skill sets mm -hmm. so they do calculate numbers faster than calculate like just not faster than calculate but 8 to 10 times faster than calculator okay we do have one question do you want to address this you can see the chat right yeah i think do you so. want to address that one yet or do you want to wait and address it later when it makes more sense with your one of your slides so yeah i saw one question from jason uh, that how do we bridge the gap between the students engaged in our program and spend the full day and the week at the school that's perfect so why what i say here that we do both the things so what we do here that 
we will if this i mean when once we get the student we do a comprehensive assessment of a student regardless no matter what the kid is coming whether they are behind or they're excelling we do an assessment to understand what understanding do they have as of now so we focus on two aspects we focus on one aspect is about the school going because we know that's very very important for them to keep up with the school curriculum and the grades and everything because that's one of the thing that parents see that oh this is the result because parents more likely what they see the bigger picture oh my kid is grading or my kid is getting a grade that means the result is good and kids also get motivated from that idea only so we focus on two parts one part is that okay we will keep up with the school curriculum whatever help you need on that we'll keep helping that we'll keep excelling that as well at the same time we also enforce our curriculum as well to build that foundation because so you have to focus on both the things you have to correct what they are going on with currently you cannot really ignore that because if you ignore that they will lose the motivation at the same time you cannot just work on that curriculum because they keep on going from there and whatever they have missed or the foundation is not strong enough they will keep on struggling no matter how much you teach them no matter how much you help them the struggling will never end because there is a lot of missing parts still there so that foundation need to be strong enough so you have to balance both the things and that what we we do i mean so that what we call our enrichment and advancement program to build that foundation along with your school staffs Vishal, do you mind if I share one of your morning, the morning blend segment where you guys had the kids come on and and share and do their brain? Yeah, you can stuff. share it. I would love. For, you guys have to see this. I was like, how are they doing math this fast? Yeah, that's Okay. Helping to take your child's brain to the next level. The Sapiens Brain Development and Learning Center, they focus on making a genuine impact on the lives of kids from kindergarten to senior year. Michael Soto is here, he's with the Sapiens, along with five Sapiens students. Hi, everybody. Hi. Oh, this is very exciting. Now, tell us, I mean, they, these are some of your uh, brightest students. You have uh, several with the Sapiens. Tell us about what the Sapiens is all about. Uh, so we're a brain development and learning center. Yeah. We do tutoring K through 12, and then we have a big spin to us where we actually focus on enhancing IQ. So we do brain exercise. Nice. Um, that translates into a lot of things like enhanced concentra uh, concentration, focus, of course, IQ. One of the a derivative of that or a result of that is being able to do mental math. Uh, so things that you know, whether it's addition, subtraction, all the way up to cube roots, square roots. And like you said, we have some of our students here today, they went through our first level of that, which is our 10 mile per hour circuit. Um, and they're gonna demonstrate some of those skills. They're square rooting in their head. They, they yeah, so at our, at our highest levels, you can do up to cube roots, actually. Uh, so I don't even know what a cube root is. Yeah, <laughs> there oh, you this go. This is fraction <laughs> decimals. <laughs> but they're gonna do our first level. So this is basically the 10 mile per hour circuit. Right That's but basically four four months of training cool. um and and yeah i'm excited to, to all right show JJ, you what they can jj do. has the mic here we're going to put the kids to the test we're going to create some champions today uh oh michael if you may yeah let's get all it right. started while we start with akis so he's going to do mental math he's going to solve this equation using mental math all right um all right so let's start off 55 21 minus 45 20 30 minus 20 minus 41 28 minus 34, 22 minus 21, 62 minus 30, minus 24, 15, 11, 20 minus 54, minus 11, 83 minus 33, minus 20, 34 minus 41, 31 minus 43, 24 minus 19, 34, 21 equals 75. Are you kidding me? Oh, good job. How? <laughs> wow. Oh Akis, great job. Thank you. My oh, goodness. Okay. I'm right. sorry for screaming. That just blew my mind. All right, go ahead. All right, Arushi's up next. I just went cross side. Uh, she's also going to do uh, mental math. So right. 37, 12, 40, minus 46, 23, minus 34, 21, 22, minus 31, 50, minus 62, 30, minus 41. 36 minus 13, 43 minus 54, 22 minus 31, 12 minus 24, 67 minus 35, 20 minus 12, minus 12, 38 minus 34, 
22 minus 34 equals? 32. Good job. Nice. <laughs> this, all right. is, this is really maddening right so, now. And as you know, all of us here, we all know the concept of addition and subtraction. So this isn't like a, a learning a formula. This yeah. is just actual brain exercise. You being able to have more neural connections with connect you to the answer quicker. I'll never buy That's faster than yeah. Google. <laughs> Try asking your Google to do it that yeah. All right, go ahead. Yes. Nice. Great Asis job, Arushi. is next. She's going to use finger theory. So this okay. is you can take a pause now. I'll explain it. Okay. Um, let me get out so of I'll here. I'll explain you something about this program. So, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, just, I mean, this is only the sapiens who does in, uh, the, I mean, in America. But in Asian countries, there are millions of kids who are doing this program for years and years. And this is like a very old program. It's like around five, 6,000 years old program which were developed in Japan. And uh, so when we moved here, as I said, so I wanted my daughter to get this program on. And I was like, I was so, so surprised that, I mean, I never would have thought that in America, nobody's teaching this. I mean, that was hard to understand or hard to, uh, you know, I mean, uh, so we got this program over here. We built this program from the scratch and we innovated a lot in this program. And as I said, this program needs a lot of discipline and uh, this is what the result we get. So what they were doing, they were using an abacus tool. I mean, you, everybody might have known what his abacus tool is. So we know abacus tool as a toy they play in the kindergarten just to count the numbers. But it is really surprised that they were using all those techniques with the abacus tool itself. So you saw that kid was doing something with his finger like this. So he was manipulating the, those bits in his brain that fast. And at that time they were in that level only, but now they work 10 times faster than that speed. Wow. So as you, go to, as you go to the next levels, your speed and your accuracy becomes more and more accurate. So that's what a brain training is. And we wish, because in some of the countries, even in India, a lot of schools, in Japan, in China, in Malaysia, a lot of schools have a mandatory program of, as a class that you have to do this class as well as a mandatory program. And it's so doable because our training is just once a week training, 90 minutes, once a week training, that's it. And you get that result in four months. And then you keep going to the next levels. They keep adding multiplication, divisions, fractions, percentages, and all those schools. So one day we wish that schools do acknowledge those, those things and we can be in the schools and we can start running those programs. In our neighborhood, we started working with Pinecrest last year. I mean, just, I mean, this year in February, but unfortunately the COVID happened, so schools were closed. So, but very soon the schools will be open again and we wish to start those programs and schools as well. Because those programs, and I mean, how do people see that? A lot of parents did ask me initially, no, we don't need to get our kids involved in those things because numbers is what? They can have calculator, they can have computers, they have those and those stuff. So I always explain to them, this is not about just giving you the ability to calculate numbers. This is training your brain. Imagine you have a computer and you are upgrading your processor. Now that processor is not limited to only numbers or a certain things. You can do pretty much anything with that computer and that computer will process faster and accurate. So this is like training your right side of the brain that gives you the ability to multiple, so like multiple processing at the same time with speed and accuracy. Vishal, have you seen a large delta in some kids picking this process up very easily and other kids having a real hard time with it? Like, so been pretty yeah. easy across the board. Yeah, so this is really great for the kids even who are struggling a lot, has no motivation at all, and they have a feeling, you know, I am so dumb, I cannot do this. And I have seen hundreds of kids like that. And we train a lot of kids. We have trained hundreds of kids in Vegas so far. And we have trained thousands of kids across the country and outside the country as well. So we do virtual learning as well. We have kids from California, Florida, Chicago, India, Dubai. So, I mean, this program is really, really amazing. And the cool thing about this program that the more younger you start, the better you start. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so when it comes to the marketing, I mean, uh, I mean, I know we are talking about marketing here more often. So I mean, uh, I will just share that what I experience the challenges and what I see there is opportunity in the market for the educational companies. 
So as I say, in America, still only quarter, I mean, 0.25% uh, of school going kids go for educational, additional education help, right? So there is a big, big opportunity to create that awareness and to show them that, you know, that additional educational help at some point of the time, whenever you feel that you are declining a little bit, go for educational help and get those things covered up so you're not declining anymore and your motivation is always up and high to keep you moving there. So the cost, I mean, uh, the biggest thing is about the cost because we focus a lot on the cost because I know the biggest challenge, why those numbers are so low for the kids to get those help because those services are so, so expensive. Even you go to the private schools, those are so expensive. So in order to bring that cost low, we are struggling a lot. We see a lot of challenges to create an awareness, to throw the word out there. So we came up with a lot of community work so until the COVID, what we were doing, since we started, we were doing a community workshops. And every week we were doing two free workshops, like two free workshops every week, open to public, like anybody can come in. And we used to have amazing attendance. I mean, I will tell you every Saturday, Sunday, every event we used to have about 80, 90 kids participated. And every week we used to do something else. So this week, for example, it's art and craft. Next week it's a chess game or a boxing or a yoga or comic book making or a music class or some or something. We used to always encourage people to come up with the idea that we can host over here because I have an amazing facility. It's a small, it's not that big, but we built in a format that we can host uh, about 120 kids at any point of time, not with the COVID situation. With the COVID situation, we're limited to only 50 kids. And we're not doing any more community workshops until COVID gets, you know, I mean, until they are free enough to get on a, not on a social distance. And there was a lot of things we are trying to do still. Uh, right, for example, with the current situation, kids going to the virtual. Right now, we are doing 100% free homework help to any Las Vegas and Henderson kids. And there's no obligation at all. You don't have to pay not even a single penny. And we are trying to help every week 500 students for completely free. Now, businesses like us, being a new business, being a small business, being an educational business, that we are trying to provide all the services at low cost and some of the services at free, we struggle a lot to bring those awareness out there. And it's being new for us. So what we are trying to do is that we are trying to ask the help from the community, that to throw the word out there to create that awareness for the people that okay we are doing this free homework help so you should go and get that facility or get that help you know because that's a lot of that's a lot of big help so it's so free that you just go to our website and uh, there are slots available multiple slots each slots are for 90 minutes and that's for kindergarten to 12th grade they can work with any subject any grades and our teachers will be there to help them Last month, we distributed free school supplies. We distributed about 5,000 kits for the school supplies, notebooks, folders, papers, pen, pencil, erasers, pencil pouch, a lot of things. Again, those were, uh, again, those were like a struggle for us because uh, low cost and free stuffs and then spend money on the marketing, it becomes extremely challenging. So, and what we are trying to communicate with a lot of big uh, marketing companies in the neighborhood or in the city level, that help those kind of companies. I know there's a lot of small businesses around this town that wants to help people. But the first thing that people are scared of helping on free is that, oh my God, I need to put more money on the marketing more than the actual help. So that's one of the big challenges that what I have seen. Vishal, would you mind just sending us after this that information so that we can post it to our and send it out and share it with our network? Yeah, sure. It's a... Uh... And just okay. yesterday, we started one more thing. Uh, it's called a free okay. comprehensive assessment at no obligation. So any kid can come and get a free comprehensive assessment. What is that? Your math, reading, and writing as per your grade level. With a real school teacher, you will be able to get that assessment done. You have no obligation to purchase any tutoring or any program with us. I'm just trying to encourage parents, at least get your child assessed, at least know that what your child needs helps and how much help. Because 
most of the young kids, when I talk about elementary level, most of the parents, I think, will be able to help by themselves. It's not a, I mean, you know, at the at elementary level, it's not a big of a help that parents cannot do it. But the problem is parents do not know where exactly I need to help my child to. Are they struggling with this particular thing? They do not know that. So we just started that, to, yeah, I mean, just here, yeah, I mean, we just launched it that uh, anybody can walk in and get a free comprehensive assessment as well. Even that is completely free and there are a lot of slots available throughout the week. But again, and, uh, as I'm saying that there is a really big opportunity to, for the educational companies to go out and create help and awareness. But the challenge is, again, the cost with the educational because I just saw my Facebook bill last week. So just after the pandemic, we ended up spending $6,000 just on Facebook. Now there are Instagram, Google, and local marketing companies and flyers, and there's a lot of things goes on. So my idea is that instead of me spending thousands of dollars every month on marketing, why don't we give it back to the students to provide them those help, either at free or either at extremely low cost. And since last month, we started putting down a lot of uh, press release and a lot of newsletters and a lot of things in order to create that awareness. So, I mean, we are hoping that we'll be able to get success there to get help from the community to get those words out there. And that is what actually needed here. I mean, this is what actually needed. And once people like, uh, you know, I mean, people like educational companies come up and start doing those, within a year, there will be a big change will be visible because in any educational health, it takes some time to show that changes. I mean, it cannot, uh, so a kid is coming with us. I mean, they need to come or they need to get help at least, at least a month or two, you know, to start getting those change or start seeing those change or start seeing those grades up. I mean, the effective tools, what we're using for marketing communication is nothing crazy. I mean, everybody is using the same tools, all social medias and TV medias and community effort. So with the community effort, as I said, we are trying to provide all the free classes and free helps and free school supplies. And I have seen because I got motivated. I was never, you know, never in a mindset of providing anything free. But after the COVID, when I started opening back on May 23rd, we opened back here. We started a summer camp at a very low cost, $25 a day. And the kids can spend from 7.30 in the morning to 6 in the evening. And parents did appreciate it because that was one of a kind of a summer camp where we were just not having fun all day, not like a movies or games or something. Uh, from 7.30 to 12, they were really doing a serious academic work, like serious academic work, like you are at a school. It's not a summer camp, it's a school. And after post lunch, they were forced to watch a documentaries every day, science, history, oceans, animals, planets, and all those things. And so that what we created a structure and parents did appreciate it a lot. Because uh, that's what we need here. I mean, that's what we motivation need. That's what discipline we need around the learning. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vishal, for sharing. And again, thank you, Bridget. We're so glad. I know a few of them had to jump off, uh, but this will go out. We are recording. We recorded this um, 